Thank you. You may be seated. In Jude, verse 3, very familiar verse, says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. I find that Jesus categorizes, we're going to look here in just a little bit, people into two different categories often. It didn't matter if they were Jew, Gentile, heathen. Uh, one, one instance is when he said, if you gather not with me, you scatter abroad. You're one of the two. It didn't matter what nationality or whatever you were. If you didn't gather with them, you scattered abroad. And so there's many times when Jesus uh, categorizes people in that way. And I want to talk about two different categories today. Uh, and I hope that all of us want to be in the right category, but uh, we're going to talk about it. Because this is a very important aspect that goes down into the core roots and foundations of why we do what we do, who we are, where we're headed, and all of that. You can see I wrote up here on the board two different quotes of Scripture, but I left out a couple verses because I want you to understand that those are two principles. Romans 10 it says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. But that principle, you can, you can blot the word righteousness out and you can put many different things in there, and that's still the same issue. Yeah. It's, it's the reason they were doing what he was saying they were doing is because they being ignorant of God's doctrine, wisdom, love, any of these words and many other words to be inserted there. They being ignorant of God's love and going about to establish their own love have not submitted themselves unto the love of God. Modesty, humility, program. In Mark 7, full well you reject the blank of God that you may keep your own blank okay this is a core issue and all of us are in danger of doing this yeah. I don't believe anybody that I know holds a candle to Job I certainly wouldn't want to stand next to him on judgment day and yet the one place where Job was rebuked was this issue right here. God says to Job, Wilt thou disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? That's the core issue. In other words, Job, not realizing it, had offended God in a very fundamental way. He questioned uh, God's wisdom, God's program, God's choice, in an effort to establish his own innocence. Wilt thou disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? Um, I don't think that Job realized he was doing that or wanted to do that, but he did it. Okay? So, you may not realize what you're doing, and you may not want to do it, but it's very possible that you've got some of this in you too, and I as well. What I have found... It really doesn't matter what you put in the blanks, okay? It doesn't matter what it is. Actually, any of these mean all of them. Right. Okay? You put any one of those in there, and basically you've all you put all of them in there. Because if you are not, if you're ignorant of God, and this ignorant here in the context is willful ignorance. Right. The Jews weren't really unknowing. They were willfully resisting, okay? So their ignorance was their choice. They be ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own. That's where the ignorance came from. Yeah. They were busy establishing their own. And if you put wisdom in there, then it, it, it goes along with everything else. Full well you reject God's way, will, program, wisdom, interpretation, humility, modesty, pro all of it. It's because you're going to want to keep your own. Right. And we've got to, we've got to flee from such a thing. We've got to militate against it. We've got to consider it an enemy. Yeah. If something in us, if we have a problem with something that is God's 
standard, God's truth. You see, there is a continual strife and a continual friction between the standard that God holds and what men think and what men prefer. There is a truth. There is a faith once delivered to the saints. There is a pattern. There is a righteousness. And those who strive to uphold the standard, the truth, the program, the faith, will always be experiencing friction and battle and conflict with those who are seeking their own. We read about it Wednesday night in the, the book where it talks about some people, the acid test of issues in life is how will this affect me? What will this do to me? How, how, what will this do for me or against me? Or how will this, how will this affect my well-being? How will this affect what I like and don't like? That becomes the acid test for issues. The acid test for issues may be, how does this line up with my concept of Christ's likeness? And so they have a concept of Christ's likeness all their own. And they judge everything based on their concept of Christ's likeness. And if that, if that idea is skewed, then everything is skewed. In Acts 17, uh, we find in verse 10, The brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming hither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed. Now, there are those who are, who are busy doing this, and then there are those, and it really doesn't matter. The only thing that matters to them is, are these things so? The noble Bereans were noble because they, didn't, they were willing to hear what Paul said. You know, I've talked to a lot of people, well, I don't read anything but the Bible. That's not true. You go and you right. listen to radio preachers. You listen to sermons on Sunday. Mm -hmm. You read the newspaper. You read what you want to read. Right. But they don't want to read your book or they don't want to read something that they think is maybe challenging their comfort zone, right. challenging their paradigm. And so they say, well, I, I only read the Bible. And that's not even true. The Bereans didn't tell Paul and Silas when they came, well, we only read the Bible. No, they listened to the word that right. they had to say with all readiness of mind, and then they searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. Right. That's true nobility. Amen. Okay? I'll hear what you have to say. I will consider it, and I will search the Scriptures, and I'm not searching the Scriptures to make sure my ism comes out on top. I'm not searching the Scriptures to make sure that you don't cramp my style. I'm not searching the Scriptures to make sure that I'm not made to be uncomfortable or, or I'm, not, I'm not, you know, you're not uh, making me unhappy. But I'm searching the Scriptures with one thing in view. Are these things so? Amen. Are these things so? If they're so, then I want to believe them. If they're so, I want to embrace them. If they're so, then they are from God. And we search the Scriptures to find out, are these things so? You know, I gave myself to such a mindset many years ago. In the midst of confusing opinions and religion, I determined that I don't, I don't care what this guy thinks or that guy thinks. I want to know, I want to search the scriptures, I want to know, is it so? Is it so? If it's so, then I'm going to embrace it. I'm going to get on the truth train. I don't care where it's going. That's where I'm going. All I want to know is, is it so? And it led me places that I never dreamed it would lead me. And I still feel that way. And the, the frustrating thing is, is as you grow in grace, you realize, yeah, there are two types of people. There are those who seek their own and those who simply want to know, are these things so? Let me read you something. 
We've got the same thing in the political world. It's all over the place. Yeah. And I read this to some of the guys, but this was an email I got this week. Tuesday morning, the fake news, anti-gun lawmakers, and gun control groups were jumping up and down as another school shooting was playing out on national TV. Like all the shootings before it, gun grabbers were hoping to use the news of the Maryland school shooting to further their anti-gun agenda. But by noon, the story seemingly vanished. That's because, far from making the case for gun control, the Maryland shooting showed the utter failure of gun control in stopping violent crime. Instead, it showed, yet again, the need to do away with deadly gun-free zones immediately. You see, Maryland is a gun control activist dream come true. Maryland already has a complete firearms registration program in place, putting every gun owner in a central database. Maryland also has a complete ban on the AR-15 and 45 related firearms. Maryland has a ban on mags that hold over 10 rounds of, of ammunition. Maryland has extensive gun-free zones, including the school in question from yesterday. Lastly, Maryland has a seven-day waiting period on all handgun sales. But, as is always the case, all of that gun control failed to stop the criminal who ignored all of those laws as he carried out his violent act. But it gets even worse for the radical gun grabbers. That's because while all the gun control laws in Maryland failed to stop the shooter, he was stopped by a good guy with a gun. An armed school resource officer was on site, heard the attack taking place, and shot and killed the suspect during the shooting spree. Now, the problem with that is, there's a lot of people who don't care about the facts. Right. They don't care about the facts. They're going about to establish their own agenda, their own idea, and the facts are irrelevant. Now, in the political realm, it's frustrating. I see it all the time. In the spiritual realm, it is eternally devastating. Right. In the spiritual realm, it's even more frustrating. In the spiritual realm, it should cause the blood to come up in your face. Yes. When you realize that not, not just ignorant people, but pastors and teachers and seminary professors are in the business of rejecting the commandment of God that they may keep their own tradition. And that is leading souls to damnation That's right. and not salvation. Today is Palm Sunday. In John 12, 9 we read, you know what Palm Sunday is, that's the triumphal entry, the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem and taught for a week and preached and cleansed the temple and cursed the fig tree and a number of things before he was arrested and crucified uh, this coming Friday, rose this coming Sunday. John 12, 9, much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was come, that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees, and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Here we see a perfect example. The facts to some people are irrelevant. Mm -hmm. We're going to put Lazarus to death. Why? Because this guy raised him from the dead and therefore people are believing on him. <laughs> Where's your brain? You don't, you don't care about the facts. That's a problem. No. They had an agenda. They were going about to establish their own and the facts became irrelevant. Are these things so? Did not matter to them. That's a scary and sad place to be. Yes, sir. We need, we need to be in the category, and I ask where I want to be. Are these things so? That's all that matters. The facts are relevant. Did, did this guy raise him from the dead, yes or no? If he did, then those facts need to be, we need to look at those facts. Don't just say, well, we need to get rid of this guy, and we'll get rid of him too. But that's, people get into that rut. Yep. When they want to preserve something of their own, they being ignorant of God's and going about to establish their own, 
have not submitted themselves. Oh, right. there's a word. To have gods, you must reject your own and submit to his. There is a root of the problem. You know, in one place, Jesus said, after he cleansed the temple, he said, my house should be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it. And it really doesn't matter what you put in there, does it? Right. It doesn't matter whether you've made it a salon, or you've made it a den of thieves, or you made it a circus. Maybe you've made it a, uh, um, a humanitarian station. Mm -hmm. It really doesn't matter. If it's contrary to what God wanted it to be, it's wrong. Right. Does that matter? Does that matter to anybody? My house should be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it something else. And it doesn't matter what else it is, it's wrong. And God will not accept it. Full well you reject the blank of God that you may keep your own blank. What's he saying? They don't blend. One must be sacrificed for the other. If you cannot blend my own with His way, your own has to be laid aside. Whatever it is, if you're going to do it God's way. Jesus said no man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And those are the two ideas there. You cannot serve God's way and Mammon includes anything else. Okay? My own. My own gain financially. The word mammon includes basically carnal gain. That which is not in line with God. Uh, Matthew 12 30. He that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. <clears throat> now, in John 15, you can turn there if you would. We find Jesus separating them and us. Okay? And them doesn't mean Gentiles. Them doesn't just mean that, oh, those evolutionists, communists, atheists, Islamic. No, them is everybody who's not us. Okay? And we find out that the them is the most religious group in Israel. Sometimes. He said, if the world hate you, John 15, 18. If the world hate you, what do you mean the world? Well, we're going to find out. You know that it hated me before it hated you. There's a controversy here. There's, some, there's an antagonism here. If he were of the world, the world would love what? His own. His own. There you go. Going about to establish their own. They've not submitted themselves unto God. Full well you reject the commandment of God that you keep your own. Okay? That crowd, that crowd who is seeking their own is the world. Right. Doesn't matter what their name is, what their color is, what their nationality is, what their religion is, what their position is. They're the world, and Jesus is speaking here. Yes. But because ye are not of the world, you're not of this crowd, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. There is a continual friction. There's a continual frustration. There is a, a zone of controversy when his meets their own. Okay? So Jesus sets these up in two categories. Like in, in Hebrews 10, it says, Forsake not the assuming of yourselves as the manner of some is. Okay, that's, those, that's that crowd. Some. Whoever they are, whatever they are, they're not following the program. They've got their own program. Remember the word that I said unto you? The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they, who's the they? That crowd. The ones who are seeking their own. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. For the same reasons. Okay? It's the same controversy. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Well, that said somewhat in irony. Because the they did not keep his sayings. They did persecute him, okay? And 
So what he's saying here is the servant is not greater than his Lord. You are not, if you are going to stay in the category of keeping God's way and not fall into the category of your own, then you're not going to improve on Jesus. The moment that you have improved on Jesus, so the world doesn't hate you like it hated him, and the world listens to you better than it listened to him, you know what you've done? You've changed categories. Right. You've created your own. And your own is more acceptable to the world. Right. But his will never be more acceptable to the world Amen. until they repent and become his. You understand that? The servant is not greater than his Lord. He's saying, you're not going to improve on me. The more you're like me, the more they're going to treat you like they treated me. Right. The more you're like me, they're going to listen to you the way they listen to me. Because if you find a way to make them listen better and love you better and appreciate you better and build museums for you and, and have the whole nation applaud you, then it's because you are yep. seeking your own and they, they sense that. They can smell it. Yes. They can tell that you're one of them. It's a spiritual thing. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had come, if I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. In other words, their ignorance would then be somewhat excusable. But now they have no cloak for their sin. Now they have been confronted with the truth. You say, well, they haven't listened to it. No, they haven't listened to it. You say they're still ignorant of it. That's right. They're, now they're will, willingly ignorant of it. And willful ignorance places you in the category of sin. Right. He, he, uh, <clears throat> but now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works that none of the man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. Mm -hmm. Searching the scriptures to find if these things are so. If they are so, they must be embraced. Right. Or now you are committing sin. That's right. You are held accountable. If someone has brought a, a controversy, an issue, if someone has brought it to your attention, and you have not searched it out to find it, these things are so, and thus embraced the scriptural way, if you've set it aside because you really don't want to know if it's so, you really don't want to be bothered by it, you don't want to be confused with the facts, you don't want to be, you don't want your, uh, you know, your ism getting upset with you, then it becomes sin. That's right. Even if the word ignorance is appropriate. Be noble or be condemned. Those are your choices. You can be noble and listen and search the scriptures and find truth and be pursuing truth like the pearl of great price. Or you can be condemned. Well, I really don't want to be in either cat. You can't help it. That's right. Because going about to establish your own can also include peace at the expense of truth. Yes. This can also include safety at the expense of truth. Or acceptance at the expense of truth. But when the comfort, verse 26, but when the comforter has come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended, stumbled. In other words, you lovers of truth, you noble Bereans who just want to know if it's so, and if it's so, it doesn't matter what camp it puts you in. It doesn't matter what, it matter what camp it brings you out of. It doesn't matter who's mad at you. It doesn't matter what fringe benefits you lose. It doesn't matter if you're ostracized or accepted. You're a noble Berean, and if it's so, if it's in the Word of God, I want it. It's mine. I want it His way. Okay, then when you go out and you start sharing the truth, and they treat you like they treated Jesus. And they don't listen. And you find out that they're rejecting the way of God to keep their own. Mm -hmm. He said, I've told you all this beforehand so you won't be stumbled. Right. I've, I've, I've explained this to you. <clears throat> and so you won't think that, well, 
you know, maybe maybe I need to do what that preacher over there is doing. He's got a mega church, you know. Maybe I need to learn from him. Mm. Jesus said that's that's being stumbled. Yep. Right there. Right. That's being stumbled. Because what he's doing is thinking he's improved on Jesus. He's establishing his own and not submitting to God's. Because Jesus said, you're not going to improve on me. You're not going to improve on the Master. You may switch camps, but you're not going to improve on Jesus. Right. They shall be put out of the synagogue. Or they shall put you out of the synagogue. Okay? He said, I've, I've written this so you won't be stumbled. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Mm. Well, that, mean, that is an obvious that at this time all the Christians were in the synagogues. And they would be for some time, by the way. Uh, when, you, when, when Saul was persecuting the church, he got letters to Damascus to the synagogues. He was going to go to the synagogues and find out if there were any of this way and bring them bound. Okay? Mm -hmm. All the Christians were still a part of the synagogues at that time. Um, and, and when they got kicked out of the synagogues, then they began having their own meetings patterned after the pattern of the synagogues because that's the pattern that was God-ordained. And that's when the Christians began meeting separately. But he says, they shall put you out of the synagogue. Do you know a Jew being put out of the synagogue was a big deal? Yep. You became a nobody. Your family rejected you. You're, you may have lost your job. Uh, the, uh, the social benefits, the financial benefits, the, uh, you know, all that was, was taken away if you were kicked out of the synagogue. You became like a leper, pushed out of the camp. And you were treated like it. He said, that's what they're going to do to you. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Because he's getting rid of you. He's going to think that he's actually doing God's service by getting rid of you. Well, we find that played out in the book of Acts. They called, they said Paul, he's a pestilent fellow, a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene. This guy is a pest. He's a problem. He's a disease among Ju uh, Judaism. We're trying to get rid of him. Well, that's exactly the way Paul previously thought about Christianity. He was exceeding mad against him, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against him. He was going to rid Judaism of these pests, these parasites, these these uh, wicked intruders. And then he realized, oh my. Jesus said, why persecutest thou me? So we find out they will be in charge of the synagogues. They will be there think that they're pleasing God. And these things will they do unto you because they know not the Father nor me. But these things have I told you that when the times will come, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said unto you not at the beginning, because I was with you. Jesus was with them. All the antagonism was toward Jesus. But now he's going to be gone. The antagonism will be pointed at them. In Philippians 2.19, we find Paul saying, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things that are Jesus Christ's. What a sad commentary on many of the religious leaders of that day, even Christian religious leaders. Paul had a problem with having a man whom he could trust. In one place he says, they preach Christ even of contention and not sincerely. What a shame. They seek their own and not the things that are Jesus Christ's. Well, you say, how does one know? This is obviously a very subtle thing. If even Job was stumbled in this area. How do we know? How can you know that you're not doing this? Oh, it's all just confusion. Everybody's arguing doctrine out there. They'll, it'll be arguing doctrine for the, till the world's ended. Till we're, we're, you know, doctrine is divisive and we don't want to get... You're, you're establishing your own. Right, yeah. You're establishing your own. It's too much trouble to seek out. Search the Scriptures. Are these things so? 
And if they're so, you stand on it. You embrace it. You teach it. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of trouble. That's a lot of headache. It causes problems. So, I'm going to establish my own. I'm going to pick a course that doesn't bother anybody. Yeah. I'm, going to pick, I'm going to pick a course that, you know, is, is more acceptable. Well, that's a very dangerous thing to do. That's right. Now, there are people who work at being unacceptable, who work at being rejected, just so they can feel they're establishing their own as well. well that's right. Okay? So how do we know? Number one, let me ask you some questions. These are questions to help you categorize yourself. How concerned are you about your people being wrong? How concerned are you about your heritage being proven right or wrong? You see, I ask that question because my heritage, my people, are not part of the problem, not part of the issue. The issue is, are these things so? Right. A Berean says, are these things so? It doesn't matter if my people are right or wrong, or my heritage is right or wrong. Bereans don't worry about that. How concerned are you about learning something new that brings you into conflict with your camp? How concerned are you about losing the benefits of your camp or crowd? If you could be more correct and accurate with the word, is it worth the pain of study, prayer, and persecution to become so? Here's some big ones. Number six, are you willing to discuss, dispute, study, pray, and search out the facts? Are you willing to be found in error and corrected if it means finding the truth? Are you willing, in other words, are you willing to wade into this issue, asking questions, bringing up issues? Okay, if, 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 if some of those things that you assumed were right become wrong. If finding, is, is finding the truth so valuable? You know, when I began dairying, man, I, I, I knew a little bit about dairying or I wouldn't even got into it. I'd been milking my own personal cow for about 10 years. But I knew, I, I knew how to build a building. But keeping a herd of cows healthy and milking and all that goes with it, there was a lot of things I didn't know. The question is, did I want to become a dairyman bad enough to go through the dummy stage? There was a lot of humbling situations where I thought I knew something that I didn't know anything about. Where I asked questions that people laughed at. Where I said, well, isn't this true? And they just looked at me with that look. No. Oh. You know, you know what I'm saying? The dummy stage. You ever start a new job? You know? And, and, okay. The question is, are we, in growing in grace and truth and understanding truth, are we willing to go through the dummy stage? Are we willing to be shown to be in error when we bring up our, when we bring up our impeccable case and people shoot a bunch of holes in it. We're willing to say, ah, I see. I didn't know those holes were there. Now I see. You know, I've been there many times. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I'm not a Baptist anymore. That's why I'm where I'm at. Let me ask you number seven. Are you praying daily for truth and telling God that you want truth, even if it brings pain, division, study, poverty, or death? Are you asking questions and seeking answers from more than just your crowd? Are you willing to read both sides of the issue? If there is a controversy, does it matter to you to find the truth for your own life and witness? Are you content to stay in the groove? Well, I just, I just let my preacher figure that out. Well, I, I think that in the process of you growing and being a noble Berean, you ought to ask your preacher's opinion. You ought to say, look, this is what I've come up with. What do you think? Show me, you know, show me the holes in it if there's holes in it. Someone who really wants truth is not going to hide. Well, I, I don't want to ask him. Why don't you want to ask him? You afraid he might see a hole in your case? You know, there was many times when we left the Baptist church when people would want to, you know, people would want to argue and ask questions of my wife 
but they don't want to come and ask me. And she said, well, you need to talk to Mark, or you need to tell so-and-so, he needs to go talk to Mark. And one time they said, well, Mark knows his Bible too well. Oh. <laughs> so what, what's the agenda anyways? What's the agenda? Do you really want answers or not? Are you willing to read both sides of the issue? Or number, number 10, are you willing to face the issues on your knees and study your Bible to rightly divide it? Do you love the Word enough to want to teach it accurately? There's a big one. Mm -hmm. Do you love the Word? Do you love God to the point that I don't want to say anything that's inaccurate? I don't want to mislead anybody. I don't want to misrepresent, re misrepresent my Lord in any particular. I don't want to misrepresent my Lord uh, through anything that I teach or preach or believe. I want to know the truth. I want to have all truth. Uh, and I'm willing to stand on that so I can properly represent the Word. Well, you know, are these, have, are these salvation issues? So that, that's all you're in it for. So as long as you can get to heaven, you really don't care about properly representing the Word. Is that what you're telling me? So as long as you get your little mansion over the hilltop, accuracy and truth and God's way being properly represented really isn't that big a deal. Well, I hope, I hope for your sake that He's not offended by that on Judgment Day, but I don't think it's going to work that way. Nope. Number 11. Are you willing to get on the truth train and let it take you wherever it's going? Now, we're about out of time. But I, I wrote down a number of issues. Because people say, oh yeah, 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 I'm a Berean, yeah, yeah. But there's a number of issues that I could bring up that would surprise you. I'm going to mention one, okay? Just because this is one that I was surprised how even commentators tiptoed. Um, turn to Luke 22. Luke 22, 14. And when the hour was come, he sat down with the twelve apostles with him, and he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not eat, I will not any more eat thereof, of the Passover, until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now it would be a good question for people when is that? And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is broken for you. This is in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Now look at verse 28. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptation, and I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father appoint, has appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Verse 30 could not be found in Marcion's Bible. Nope. He erased it. He erased verse 30 out of his Bible. Was he... What? He was one of them. Going about to establish his own. He just took it out of the Bible. Obviously, this is talking about when Jesus comes again and sets up a kingdom on earth, which he didn't want to acknowledge. He wanted to spiritualize it, and verse 30 did not fit in his spiritualization. Okay? So when is Jesus going to eat and drink the Passover again? When he comes in the kingdom on earth. Matthew 19, 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's what it's talking about. Read Luke 19. Occupy till I come. We're occupying now till he comes and sets up his throne. Okay. So to try and spiritualize that away is is like is a Marcion trick. Now, that wasn't the actual point. Go down to verse 31. Let's keep reading. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. 
And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. And he said unto them, When I sent you, now this was on the Galilean preaching trip, okay? He sent them before him two by two, remember that? Mm -hmm. When I sent you without purse and script and shoes, lacked you anything on your preaching trip? And they said nothing. Then said he unto them, But now, now I'm going to send you out on another preaching trip, okay? Now as you go out to preach, he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise a script, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Uh oh. Did the apostles obey Jesus' teaching? This was a very sacred time. Jesus is about to die. These are some of his last words to his disciples before he died. Mm -hmm. This was a command on the very night of his death. Do you think the apostles obeyed it? Yes. You know why people squirm? Commentators even squirm. Because, depending on which way they go with it, will affect who likes them and who doesn't like them and what place they're put into. You say, well, no, because Jesus told Peter that all who use the sword will perish with the sword. Do you even know what that means? No, what you've done is you've assumed you knew what that meant, so you can establish your own. Right. Well, let's read it. Luke 22, 49. <laughs> when they which were about him saw what would happen, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear, cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. Huh. That's all he said. So if you had Luke's gospel, let me ask you this. Did the apostles obey it? Did the apostles wear swords? Yes. Well, they were wearing them in the garden. And Jesus told them to sell their shirt and buy one. So if all you had was Luke's gospel, the conclusion is, yes, of course they did. Well, let's look at John. John 18.10 Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, and smote the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father has given me, shall I not drink it? Oh. Well, if all you had was Luke and John, then you would have to assume that the apostles wore swords. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, put it in your sheath is, is what you do with your sword when it's on your side, right? And Jesus told him to sell his shirt and buy one, tell the garment and buy one. And now he told him to put it back in his sheath. Obviously, that means that now is not the time. Don't use it right now. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's look at Mark. Mark 14, 47. And one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Are you come out as against the thief with swords and with staves to take me? There's not even a rebuke. So, if you had Luke, John, and Mark, then you would believe that the apostles wore swords. Yep. Do you think that if Jesus was teaching pacifism the way people present it today, I mean, how, it's a pillar of the faith today. Do you think that three of their Gospels would have totally left out any explanation here? Or, or a clarification? No. It would, have been the, it would have been two chapters on it. Okay? Well, you say, no, it's in Matthew. Oh, it's in Matthew. But isn't Matthew where the hated exception clause is also? And I, I read in your, their literature that Matthew was written to the Jews, so the exception clause is for betrothal. Well, if Matthew's only for the Jews, then is that only for the Jews? By the way, Matthew's the only gospel where it says resist not evil. Let's read it. Matthew 26, 51. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. Okay? For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? With swords. <laughs> <laughs> but how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? Okay, now, what I gather from that is it was, it was okay to carry it, but not use it. Because carrying it wasn't rebuked. Okay, now, what does it mean? 
What does it mean? All they take the sword to perish with the sword. L listen to me. It's not even true. Nope. Did Samuel perish with the sword? Did Moses perish with the sword? Look all through the Bible. So what does it mean? Jesus wasn't speaking an untruth, was he? No, in Revelation 13.10 it says, He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. Now, in Ephesians 4.8 it says, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. Now, if the Word of God is true, that means Jesus has to go into captivity too, right? Mm -hmm. Wrong. These are maxims. These are Jewish expressions. Okay, let me read you another one. Proverbs 26, 27. Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein. He that rolleth the stone, it will return upon him. Are those, is that true? <laughs> the children, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Mm -hmm. Is that true? It's a maxim. It's a Jewish way of expressing a principle. Okay? The principle is, whoso diggeth a pit shall fall in. When you are digging a pit for somebody else, you're going to reap what you sow. He that rolls a stone, it will return upon him. That which goes around comes around. We've heard those types of ideas. Okay? It's a maxim. And the maxim means, you will get... A, um, whatever you measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Okay? God is going to judge you according to your works, according to your deeds. Now, in Revelation, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. Now, the obvious idea is he that leads into captivity in an evil, contrary principle to God. Because those who lead into captivity for God are not going to be judged by being sent into captivity. Right. Those who lead into captivity contrary to God will reap a similar judgment from God. God is in the equation. He that diggeth a pit contrary to God will fall into a pit by God's judgment. A similar situation. Okay? In other words, the <coughs> false accuser wants certain person to be put to death by falsely accusing him. The proper judgment is you need to be put to death. You need to have the judgment that you desired upon the innocent person. Okay? You reap what you sow. This is called uh, justice. Now, he that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. That means he that kills with the sword contrary to God's will, way, order, and justice will be reaping a similar judgment from God. So, all that Jesus was doing was telling Peter in a Jewish way that this is not the appropriate time to use the sword. And the Jews understood that. The apostles understood that. The Christians understood that at the time. Well, I heard an early Christian. No, that Christian was in hundred years later. Two hundred years later. And they were corrupted by Marcionism and all of the other garbage of the day. And the fact is, well, so-and-so said this. You wouldn't believe you wouldn't do what everything else so and so said. Right. 90% of what that so and so said, you would not do, you would not believe, you would not practice, but this one thing you pull out and say, this was the official church position. Mm. That's a lie. Amen. Not even true. <clears throat> Psalm 7:14, David is praying. He says, "Behold, he travaileth with iniquity and hath conceived mischief and brought forth falsehood." He made a pit and digged it and has fallen into the ditch which he made. You cannot take that literal. That's a Jewish way of stating a principle. His mischief shall return upon his own head and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own pate. These are Jewish expressions. Jesus was a Jew and he made a Jewish expression. So, the question. Did the apostles obey Jesus? Should we assume they did not? No. The context is, sell your garment and buy a sword for the purpose of self-defense. Okay, the context. Check it out. Anybody who wants to give the Bible its due place would say, of course they obeyed Jesus. Right. <clears throat> no, but, oh, I think he was speaking proverbial. Well, did he speak proverbial about the purse and the, the everything else, when he told him to go out the first time and said, don't take this and don't take that, was that proverbial too? No. You can't do that with the Scripture. That's unjust. Right. 
Did the apostles understand the difference between the church and the kingdom? He said here, The comforter has come, you will testify of me, and ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. But that doesn't seem to matter to much people. No. That they had been with him from the beginning, and they understood. Okay, the way that people today understand Jesus in, in, in what the apostles wrote, they assume that in the garden, the apostles just didn't get it yet. Mm. When they said, behold, here are two swords, when they were wearing a sword, uh, they, they assumed that they just didn't, they were just dummies. But if I had been with Jesus and heard Him preach the Sermon on the Mount probably ten different times in ten different places, okay, if I heard it enough to write it down by memory, word for word, mm -hmm. and record it, I would have understood, I would have not had a sword. <laughs> in Acts 1.1 1, 1, the former treaties have I made O Theophilus of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days now what do they do during these forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. But most commentators totally ignore that. And they go down and they read verse 6. When they were therefore come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his power. Okay? He had already talked to them for 40 days about the kingdom of God. They knew what it was going to be. They knew what it was going to be like. But most people say, well, they still didn't get it. They didn't understand that the church was the kingdom. And it's a spiritual kingdom. And there are aspects where those things are true. But it, th there's a lot of error on the assumption that the apostles didn't understand. No, they did understand. They didn't know the time. And he never told them the time. But they understood the nature of the kingdom perfectly. People like Marcion, they leave certain verses out because they don't want to, they don't want to acknowledge the obvious. We need to be careful. I could go to Matthew 5 where it says, uh, He that hath my... Now let's see, Matthew 5, 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so. He should be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same should be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, did the apostles do and teach unto the least commandment? Did Jesus do and teach unto the least commandment? A lot of people would say, no. They totally ignore the verse. They totally reject the verse. Matthew 23. The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses, verse 2. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their work, for they say and do not. Did Jesus live according to that himself? And who was he talking to? He talked to the multitude and to his disciples. So, did Jesus' disciples live a complete Judaism? That's why they were still in the synagogues when, the, when Saul was persecuting them. That's why Jesus said they're going to kick you out of the synagogue. They were all still there. Yes, they were living a fully Jewish life. Jesus never changed that. He never taught anything contrary to the law of Moses. Okay, the problem is that we have two types of people in the world. There are those who want to know, are these things so? That's all they want to know. And then there are those who are going about to establish their own, keep their own, and not submit to God's. Okay? And it's an easy groove to slip into. We see that Job, in the midst of his trial, even slipped into it. Any of us, we've got to be constantly on guard when dealing with issues. Am I biased? Is there some personal issue involved here? Is there something, is there, am I totally in neutral? Or am I in a gear that, that's 
pushing my way? Am I going to the Bible to defend my church and my congregation and my denomination and my people and my heritage? Or am I going to buy to the Bible to search with a very judicious, a very uh, unbiased mind? I want to know, are these things so? That's all I want to know. Are these things so? And if they're so, then that's what I want to believe. Mm -hmm. When you have people that say, well, you can't come to our synagogue unless you agree with us. They're not a Berean. Oh, my church can teach me. You're not a Berean. Oh, I only read the Bible. I don't, I, I don't want to hear anything. I don't want to hear anything different than what my church says. You're not a Berean. When the apostles showed up, they had something different than what their synagogue had been teaching. But the noble Bereans listened. They listened and they searched the scriptures to see if these things were so. And if they were in line with the scriptures, if they were in line with the scriptures, that's all that mattered. You know, there was a day in my life when I, was to, I didn't know the Bible very well. I was in Bible college, and I'd meet people from another Bible college. And they would confront me with what, you know, their proof text. And it seemed to be contrary to what I was being taught. And there was that natural tendency, I want my college to come out on top. I want my college to be right and your college to be wrong. In, in Springfield, Missouri, there was BBC and CBC. One was Assemblies of God and one was Baptist. I was going to BBC. Naturally, I would want BBC to be right. That's my college. But I knew in my heart, that's not what it's all about. That's not what it's all about. Is it so? If they're right, maybe I need to switch colleges. And so, in my searching and praying, I would pray, God, I want truth. I want the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I don't want error. I understand there's a lot of confusion, but God, I want to know the truth. I want to know, are these things so? And it's amazing. When, when that became my modus operandi, that became my driving force. There's great freedom there. Mm -hmm. There's great freedom there. Because, and the reason that it would be scary is like, well, the Bible says a lot of things. Can the Bible be trusted? Will the Bible lead me into no man's land? Will the Bible lead me into a scary position? You can trust the Bible. Amen. You can trust God's truth. You can understand. Oh, what if I find contradictions? Mm. There are no contradictions. Amen. What's, what may look like a contradiction... When you search and study it out and find out the truth, the context, the historical usage, and so forth, you'll find out it's not contradicting. That's it's right. God's Word. I've been searching it out for about 35 years now. I want to know, are these things so? If they're so, I want them. If it's a pearl of great price, I want it. Well, what if you have to sell that? I don't care. I want the pearl of great price. I want you to be a noble Berean. You don't have to like me or agree with me, but in your heart, you will either be noble or condemned. One of the two. You will either be ignorantly going about to establish your own righteousness or you'll be submitting to God's. You'll be uh, either keeping your own tradition and rejecting God's commandment or rejecting your own and keeping God's commandment. You've got to purpose that the only thing that matters are these things so. And you've got to be willing to put forth the effort, the prayer, the tears. God, I just want to know the truth. God, show me the truth. I'm willing, I'm willing to go anywhere, change anything. I just want to know the truth. I have prayed that for years, and I still feel it. And if anybody can come and show me in the Word of God where my position is wrong, my direction is wrong, my definition is wrong, 
I want to know. Amen. It, I, I'm and not going to do it. i say, oh, I don't care about that. It's going to bug me until I know. Right. I want to know, are these things so? Let's stand together. You, you can trust the Bible. There's a lot of people who don't think they can trust the Bible. They want to use the Bible to establish their own because they don't really think they can trust the Bible. They want to use it because it's got a lot of good things, but you can't just you can't just follow all of it. Hmm. So you take what's good and you decide for yourself what's right for you. Hmm. You can take that path. That's what these people were doing. Or you can just be a noble Berean to where the only thing that matters, the only thing that really matters, are these things so. Yeah. And if they're so, I want them. Amen? Amen? Any thoughts before we go to prayer? You know, the Bereans, they still have to work. They still have to earn a living. They still have to eat. They found time to study on a regular basis. We probably have it easier than they did. Yeah. You know, studying is, is hard. In fact, I found that if I am physically tired, studying is really hard. I have to take time to rest before I can study. And that means I have to let other things go. I have things on my list to do have to be put off. And that's just a reality. I hope you do that for your prayer time. I mean, I, my, my schedule could become so full that there's no time to read, study or pray mm -hmm. or witness or go to church it could fill up we did de we determine what's valuable right. brother mark you mentioned about contradictions like you know i met people that their focus is on looking for contradictions exactly mm -hmm. it's like so it's like you know okay wait a minute it's like are you looking at like you said, both sides. Are you trying to see what's really there, the truth? But no, they're, I mean, I'm talking about a Baptist college, Tennessee Timber University, that used to be there. And I had went there years later to visit because I was visiting my parents and everything. And I mean, automatically they were trying to show me, you know, I've just, I'm learning that the King James Version has contradictions. And, and that's, it seemed like, okay, well, that's their focus then. I mean, that's the way they were. The first thing that came up. And you know why? You know why it comes up? Uh -huh. Right. They may keep their own. Right. If we can, if we can degrade Moses, if we can degrade the apostles, if we can degrade the Word of God, then we can keep our own. Well, who's to say that I, in my own opinions, don't have contradictions within me? Right. Do I therefore throw out all my ideas because I have contradictions somewhere? I've talked to people who said, well, I'm studying the issue. Oh, you are? What are you reading? All the books from my church that defend my site. Like that. Well, when you're done reading those, let's talk about it. No, I, I don't want to. All I want to know is what my church tells me. Like, okay, well, you've just categorized yourself. Mm -hmm. I've, I've offered. I've offered to drive scores of hours to sit down and discuss issues with people. Let's sit down and talk about it. Let's open the Bible. Let's talk about it. Let's get a delegation from your church and some fellows from our church. Let's sit down and let's just bring this out and talk about it. No, they don't want to do that. Hmm. I met one guy that I, I, I don't know that how much he likes or respects me, but I respect one thing about him that I know of, and I don't know him hardly at all. Never met him in person. But he was going to debate me. He, he set up, I want to debate you on the subject of non-resistance. I said, that's fine. Let's set up a time. How are we going to do it? We're figuring out. I said, first of all, to save a lot of time, I said, would you read my book? And after you've read my book, then you'll know my position. Then we can get down to important issues. Instead of bantering about all the things that I've got to repeat to you, okay, read the book, and then if you still want to debate, we'll talk about it. The guy read the book. And then he contacted me and said, I don't want to debate. I agree. Wow, that's a shocker. How often does that happen? Most of the time, what happens is they'll get. I'll, I'll ask them. They'll read the books, and then they'll come back with arguments 
They were already answered in the book. Mm -hmm. Things that are totally irrelevant to my position. Mm -hmm. You didn't read the book. Or if you did read the book, it's like, well, you did You did see a couple things in the book. You were going through looking for something to right. attack. Right. You see? And so they come back with a whole bunch of stuff, and it's like, you didn't even listen. You didn't read the book. You're saying stuff that's completely off the wall, you know, just wild stuff, trying to, the last, last ditch effort to save your ism. That happens. You know what? I can't live for everybody else, and neither can you, but I want to be a Berean. For my own salvation. Yeah. For my own children. I want to be a Berean. I just want to know, are these things so? If the Mormons are right, I'll be a Mormon. If Jehovah's Witnesses are right, I'll be a Jehovah's Witness. If they're right, that means that's what God is. Amen. I've, I've, I've checked into it. That's why I'm not there. Mm -hmm. But I want to be a Berean. I want you to be a Berean. Amen. Let's pray.